Good morning, good morning. It's great to be here again. I love coming to this church. And Pastor Phil and all of you always make me feel so welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, this is kind of a special Sunday. I've been asked to uh, premiere my new book. Uh, it is, and when I say new, I mean it is new. It wasn't released until May the 1st. So uh, I'm delighted to be here with it. This is it. The book is called David the Great. This is a copy of David the Great. It is, uh, concerns the, uh, the life and leadership of King David. The subtitle is Deconstructing the Man After God's Own Heart. And that is the conundrum of David. Why is he called a man after God's own heart? Uh, I'm uh, going to be out in the lobby immediately after the service, and I hope you'll buy these books and that uh, you'll bring it by the table. Let me sign it for you or as many as you buy. Um, not the last book, 21 Seconds, but the book before that relaunch hit the New York Times bestseller list. So if each one of you will go out there and buy a thousand of these, I'm just saying, we'll teach that Bill O'Reilly a lesson. He lives on the New York Times bestseller list. I camped there for an hour in a pup tent. But I hope you'll enjoy it. I'm going to just hand this. The, the pulpit is a little bit small, and I'm going to knock it in the floor. Um, I, I, and this book is different than any book I've ever written. This is my 16th book. And um, this one is different. I wanted to reach two reading markets that are not big readers chronically. And the first is millennials. People say millennials don't read. They do read. They read differently. And uh, this book arose largely out of a series of lectures teaching over the years that I was 16, 16 years the president of two different universities. And in those 16 years, probably the topic that I spoke on, taught on, lectured on more than anything else was King David. And it was phenomenally popular. They would, the people would come in, the students, faculty, everything. And I kept getting through the years, emails and messages and phone calls. Why don't you write a book? Why don't you write a book? Why don't you write a book? So finally, I have done and I wanted to make it. It is highly practical, highly readable. And, uh, and I wanted it to be accessible. I'm not talking about dumbing, dumbing it down. That's not what I mean. It is accessible. It's bite-sized segments and easily read and, and easily applicable. And I hope it will be useful to them. The other reading market that I wanted to hit was men. Women buy books. Men uh, uh, often kind of get summaries from their wives. But uh, this, book, this book is largely for men. David was a man's man. This is a guy you want to take deer hunting with you, you know. You, you may not want him to take your wife deer hunting. <laughs> but this, this is a man's man. He's a tough guy. And I, I wrote this book with men in mind, and it has just exploded with men. We are thrilled. Um, one church where I was recently, one lady bought uh, like six cases and I said, who are these for? Her son is a master sergeant. And she bought them for all the men in his unit. Another guy bought them for all the police in his city. Uh, every, every man in the police, city police force to get a copy. So we're, we're thrilled with what's happening. One guy got it and was kind of thumbing through it at the book table. And he said, you said this was for men. He said, there's no pictures in this. <laughs> there's no pictures. I hope you'll get it and enjoy it, and, uh, and ladies, will, ladies will love it. Women are reading it. It's, it's, I'm really, really pleased with this book. It has taken off in pre-release sales faster than any book that we've ever had. Uh, it, it, as I said, just premiered in bookstores on May the 1st, but in the months before that was pre-release sales. In pre-release, we sold about 6,000 copies, and we've never had that that fast, so we're really pleased. Again, you don't need to hear me say this. But I need to say it. I do not take one penny from any book I've ever sold. I hope you buy a million copies. None of it accrues to me. It all goes to foreign missions. I hope you'll go out to the book table and spend yourself into bankruptcy. <laughs> Mortgage your house. Borrow money. 
All right, if you have your Bibles, if you'll take those, I want to read two passages of Scripture, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament, but I want to tell you they are basically the same. Now think about this. When God repeats things twice over the space of a thousand years, it must be because it's important. So the first is from 1 Samuel chapter 13. And I'm going to begin, I'm going to read basically verse 14. 1 Samuel 13 and 14. Let me just give you the context. Samuel the prophet is speaking to Saul, the first king of Israel. And Saul has disobeyed the Lord and Samuel is telling him, God will now take the kingdom away from you and give it to somebody else. But listen to the words he uses. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. The Lord has sought a man after his own heart. Now turn to the book of Acts in the New Testament. Again, the 13th chapter of the book of Acts. And I'm going to read verse uh, 21 following, a little bit following. Acts 13 and 21. Now, uh, in this passage... The pronoun references in Greek are a little bit obscure, so sometimes when they're translated in English, you have they, he, him, and it's all sort of mixed up in there. So if you'll allow me, you're following me in your Bible, but I'm going to insert the nouns where there are pronouns so you can make sense of it. And afterward, they, that is the people of Israel, and afterward, the people of Israel desired a king. And God gave him unto them Saul, the son of Kish, a man, by the, a man of the tribe of Benjamin by the space of 40 years. And when God had removed Saul, God raised up unto the people of Israel David to be their king, to whom also God gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Now, I just want to give you the key words of this. Listen to this. And God gave testimony. And God gave testimony. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that in the next few moments that your Holy Spirit will brush aside every barrier to divine communication. Speak to us, O Lord, that when we leave here today, we will say one to another, surely the Lord hath spoken unto us. In the mighty name, Jesus, the strong Son of God, Amen. Amen and amen. I was uh, in Israel. I've I've been 35 times. We're going again in a couple of weeks. And some of you are going, I'm happy to say. And um, I was in Israel, not on a tour, but there doing some research. And I was working on actually this manuscript. I was in Tiberias, a small town on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. I was sitting at an outdoor concrete picnic table. I had the manuscript stacked up and I was writing and an Israeli lady walked up and uh, we spoke for a moment. She said, are you an American? I said, yes. She said, what are you writing? I said, I'm I'm writing a book. She said, what about? I said, David. (laughs) Now I'm in Israel speaking to an Israeli woman. I said, David. She said, David who? (laughs) I said, well, actually King David. You're king, King David. She stepped back like I had touched her with a cattle prod. And she got this horrible look on her face. And she said, why? Why would you write a book about that bloody man? And I thought to myself, what manner of man is this? After 3,000 years that can make a woman that angry. This is is King David, a complex, complicated, multifaceted genius in 
genres that are seemingly mutually exclusive. So let me give you an example. David is a genius at war. To say it another way, he is a genius at killing. I went through, and I suggest you might want to do it sometime on your own, I went through and tried to uh, add up all the people that David either killed personally or, or were killed by his various agents, soldiers and armies, that kind of thing. When I got into the tens of thousands, I dropped it. David was a genius strategically at war. It shows up in his first public conflict, which is, of course, with Goliath the giant. That is a strategic victory. A lot of people don't think about it. Certainly the supernatural hand of God was upon him. But David uses wonderful strategy. This giant had a man who stood before him with a shield that was basically so big that, the, that one man held the shield. All Goliath had to do was stand behind it. As long as he stood behind that shield, those stones of David's would have been totally impotent. So David realized, I've got to get him to come out from behind that shield. So that's when David, like some kind of a streetwise basketball player, starts all this trash talk until he gets Goliath so angry, he runs out from behind the shield and charges him. That's when David drops him. And, and that strategy, David won two battles in the Valley of Rephaim that there was no way he could win either one of them against vastly superior forces. Because he both listened to God and thought strategically. He was a genius at war. He was, you don't think of a man like that as being a genius also at poetry. To write sensitive poetry that is still famous, beloved, after 3,000 years. One of the most frequently memorized and oft-quoted passages of scripture in two major religions was written by this Jewish warlord who lived 3,000 years ago, the 23rd Psalm. It's the beloved. It has been translated into nearly 5,000 languages. And then he's a musical genius. David, there's no record in Scripture, we don't know this, but there's no record in Scripture that anybody else in his family was musical. He was a musical prodigy. A child. They sent him into the pasture to tend the sheep. He came out playing guitar like Johnny B. Good. And he's writing his own music. And, and, and he won the Israeli version of the voice. When, when the king in Gibeah, up in the tribe of Benjamin, is so demonically oppressed he can't sleep at night, by that time, David, as a small child, his voice and talent are so well known in Israel that they send all the way to this remote little town of Bethlehem to get this child to sing the king to sleep at night. His elder brothers thought he was a weird little kid at best and maybe a pathological liar. Uh, he was the youngest of eight boys. The seven older were all virtually grown when he was born. He was the proverbial accident. And they figured he wasn't worth much. They sent him into the pasture. He could, wasn't old enough to fight in the army. He wasn't in the militia. He, he was just this little kid. Well, he'd come in. How did your day go? Oh, a lion came and attacked the sheep. A lion? What'd you do? Well, punched him with my little fist and killed him. The next day, what happened today? A bear came. A bear. Yeah, really? Like the lion? Yes. What'd you do? <laughs> How many of you have older siblings? How many of you have? If you told them that you punched a lion and killed it, they're going to believe you? No, they're not going to believe you. So here's what I think they said. Eliab, David's oldest brother, this is what I think he said. Okay, we're all Jews and we're all brothers. We're not going to call you a liar. But the next time, you kill some big, horrible beast. You cut its head off and lay it at my feet. When Goliath was dropped by that stone, it is not 100% clear in Hebrew that the giant was dead. It says David felled him. Then David climbs on his body, draws the giant's sword, and cuts his head off. You know what I think he did? I think he rolled it at Eliab's feet and said, how's that, sport? David is also a, a, a genius. He is a, a, a genius CEO. 
I have a whole section in the book on David the CEO. This is a part of David's life about which most people know nothing. Just before David's death, he totally restructures the Israeli bureaucracy of the government. Then, having done that, he restructures the religious bureaucracy and the musical bureaucracy. Having done that, he runs a massive capital campaign. It is a classic campaign, a modern capital campaign. He sets up the pyramid, top giver, second tier, third tier. He makes a lead gift, which was massive, by the way. The top people give, the next people give. When he gets down to the people, it says, having seen all that the leaders gave, they gave generously. And was it successful? Economists who claim to know these things, whether they know them or not, I know not, but they say that if you take the amount of money that David raised and translate it into modern American currency, that he raised, brace yourself, $56 billion. $56 billion. Then he approved all the architectural plans for the temple. Then he warehoused the materials. Then he stored the money. And he did all that knowing his name was never going to be on the sign out front. It was not ever going to be called the Temple of David. It was always going to be Solomon's Temple. Even in his, in his deathbed, David dying, dying. He, he was 70 when he died, by the way. Uh, most people don't know that. Even dying. It's, that's not a really long life, 70. But David jammed 150 years into that 70 years. His odometer broke. He's, he's wound up so many miles and he's dying, lying in his bed, dying. And he has to rise up from his deathbed and, and thwart a coup d'etat because one of his best leaders and one of his own sons are trying to usurp the throne and take it from Solomon and give it to one of his sons named Adonijah. So David's life is filled with controversy. He said, this is a complex complicated and, and I believe deeply conflicted human being. He is deeply flawed. David is not perfect. He's way to the left of perfect. Minor issues, adultery and murder. But apart from that, pretty perfect. Everybody knows about the sin with Bathsheba. There are people who know the phrase David and Bathsheba and they don't even know it's in the Bible. They, they, think it's, they think it's from Shakespeare or something. I was in Barnes & Noble the other day in the children's section buying, which may surprise you, a book for one of my grandchildren, and which I know none of you ever buy things for your grandchildren. If your children don't bankrupt you, your grandchildren will finish it off. <laughs> but I was, in the, I was in the book section at Barnes & Noble, and there was a man and a little boy kneeling down looking at books here, and there was a book there, a child's book, called David and Goliath. And the little boy said to his dad, what's this about? And the dad said, you know, it's kind of like Jack and the Beanstalk. In other words, he thought it was just another story, a child story, a fairy story, if you know what I mean. And, and I think there are people who think that about David and Bathsheba. Okay, yes, it was a terrible sin. Terrible. David, everybody knows the story. David steps out on his balcony, sees this beautiful woman bathing naked in the moonlight on the roof of her house. He brings her to his house, sleeps with her, impregnates her, and then sends for her husband, Uriah, who is one of his most trusted and effective generals, brings him back from the battlefield, thinking that if he brings him back on some some purpose or whatever, that while he's in town, he'll at least go spend the night with his wife and they can make the calendar work. David's going to palm his own baby off on one of his generals. But Uriah is a better man than David is. Uriah says, your majesty, I, my soldiers are sleeping in the battlefield. They're intense. I can't, I can't go to a warm bed with my wife. I can't do that. But he says, I'm here. At least let me pay some, some, play some purpose. I'll lie down here outside your door, and tonight I'll be your personal bodyguard. What a good guy. David rewards him by killing him, having, having him murdered. Now here's the, here's the thing. Then he marries Bathsheba. Everybody in the nation kind of blinks. Nobody wants a big deal. It's over with. It's gone. Uriah's forgotten. All of that's done. 
until one day this little prophet, not Samuel, that we just read about, but another Nathan, this feisty little guy, comes into the king's presence, not in private, in, the, in front of the whole court. All the lords and ladies are there. Everybody's there. And he looks at David and tells him this cockamamie story about a rich man who kills the poor man's lamb and eats it and all this. kind. Of, David is outraged. He says, this, this man should die. He deserves to die. And Nathan looks at him and says, you're right. He deserves to die. You're the man. You are the man. He says, I know everything you did. I know about Bathsheba. I know about that baby. And I know about Uriah. You're the man. Everybody in the courtroom gets quiet. They, all David, David is a, a, a monarch. He, they, this is not a democracy. This is not, all David has to do is snap his fingers. And somebody would kill this guy. Joab, David's kinsman and his hit man, Joab, I always told the kids at the universities, this is a very lethal hombre here. If, if David was Wyatt Earp, then Joab was Doc Holliday. This guy will bust a cap in you for a quarter. <laughs> and he, he's, he's, going for his, he's going for his sword. And David says, I did it. I did it all. What, what kind of a guy is this? And not only does he do it, he, he writes about it. Psalm 51, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this which is evil in thy sight. He writes about it. When David called Asaph, who was the worship leader at the tabernacle, David gives him the Psalm 51. He says, here, I, I want you to put this to music and sing it in the tabernacle. Asaph takes that word and his hands begin to shake. He says, your majesty, please, let's don't do this. Look at these words. In sin did my mother conceive me, in iniquity was I born. This which I've done haunts me at night. Thine evil, my evil is ever before my eyes. He said, your majesty, I got to tell you something. The people are going to, they're going to think this is about Bathsheba. David says it's about Bathsheba. He says, give it to me. And David writes, the superscription over Psalm 51 says, a psalm of David when he went in unto Bathsheba. In other words, David says, I am memorializing my own sin for all time. As long as the people of God read the word of God, I want them to know what I did. <laughs> In other words, we cannot use the sins of David to justify our own. But we can use his repentance to inform our own. The sin, of Bath sin with Bathsheba is not David's most destructive sin. Nobody sins in a vacuum. I hear young people all the time say, I'm just doing my own thing. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm just doing my own deal. Nobody sins in a vacuum. Every time anybody sins, somebody else gets hurt. When David sins with Bathsheba, Uriah the Hittite died. The baby died, by the way. But that's two. Most people don't even know about David's most destructive sin. We are so obsessed in this nation with sexual immorality that we all want to know who stormy was. But that's not the deal here. The deal here, the great sin of King David was a census. Israel was forbidden to take a census because it would lead to hubris, pride. But David insisted, even Joab, who had almost no conscience about anything, says, your majesty, please, let's don't do this census. David insists, he wants to know, I'm the leader over how many people? I'm the leader over how many troops? All of this kind of thing. David insists they do the census, and God unleashes a plague on Israel, and 70,000 Israelis die because of David's sin. Until finally, David goes before God and says, God, just kill me. These people haven't done anything. Kill me. And an angel of the Lord appears to David and says, go to this man named Ornan and buy his threshing floor, a huge rock where he's threshes wheat. Go there and buy that and offer sacrifice there. The scene is kind of funny to me. Not everybody sees things funny in the Bible. I see a lot that's funny in the Bible. 
But David goes to talk to this guy. This man and his grown sons are threshing wheat on this big stone plat table, like a big platform made of stone. And it says the angel was behind David. Now, this is not this limp-wristed, golden-haired, effeminate creature you hang on your Christmas tree. This is a very serious angel of the Lord. This is a scary thing. He's standing right behind David. And David walks in and says to this guy, I'd like to buy your threshing floor. And the guy says, it's all yours. The angel's right behind David. And David says, no, I want to buy it and I want to pay full price. He says, God forbid that I should offer any sacrifice to God that didn't cost me anything. So he buys it, offers sacrifice there, and the plague is lifted. But that's not the end of the story. When Solomon builds the temple, he builds it over that stone, and that stone becomes the altar of sacrifice. The place of judgment becomes the place of grace, and David prefigured it. David is complicated. He's a genius. He is complex. He's flawed. There are some things he's absolutely magnificently good at. There are some things he's horrible at. You know what one of those was? Family. David did not do family well. Two of his sons led coup d'etats against him. He had, David was a polygamist. Okay, that's hard for us today because we know that from the beginning, God's plan was one man and one woman that has never changed. But we have to understand the day in which David lived. People forget when this was. David was born 3,000 years ago. Think back to your college anthropology courses in history. You know what was happening 3,000 years ago. That was on the, the cusp between the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. The, the, the technology of iron is so new. In fact, do you know the first iron weapon mentioned in the Bible? It's Goliath's spear. It says the head of Goliath's spear was iron. Why would the Bible go out of its way to mention that unless the technology was so new that it was impressive? The Israelis were still fighting with bronze. The Philistines were using iron. That's how long ago. When we think about King David and his palace and all that, you can't, you can't think of Queen Elizabeth and Buckingham. David was a, a Bronze Age Jewish warlord who lived in an age of extreme violence and conquest and brutality. And the understanding, the unfolding revelation of who God was and what marriage ought to be like, David was not doing something that felt aberrant in that day. He had many wives and many concubines. But David struggled with family. He struggled with his children. He struggled to understand how to relate, how to discipline. Look, here's the thing with David. He's, this complication is what makes him both intriguing and difficult to understand. You want somebody to really admire in the Bible, it's Joseph. What a man. Why isn't Joseph called the man after God's own heart? Or Daniel? Why, why David? He is called a man after God's own heart by Samuel before we meet him. We haven't really met. When Samuel says to Saul, God will take you off the throne and replace you with a man after his own heart. Okay, we might say Samuel is speaking in advance prophetically, whatever it is, but... but Maybe after we see all these faults and foibles and the ups and downs, David's life is a roller coaster. You talk about rags to riches? That's not David. His life is rags to riches to rags to riches to rags to riches. His, his life is an unbelievable roller coaster. Shep, sheepfold to palace to prison to palace to a dungeon to palace. It's, it's, he's an outlaw, he's a brigand, he's a soldier, he's a king, he's a failure. He's a, all of these things, all in one brief 70-year span. How, how, what do we say to these things? Why is he the man after God's own heart? I've struggled with it, and as I believe so many people have, and this is what I've come to. I believe David was like one of these high-octane, powerful running backs. May God grant one 
to whatever school you cheer for. <laughs> that can burst through into the secondary and he's coming so powerfully, so hard at you. Okay, maybe you bring him down temporarily, but he's going to fall for three and a half yards because he's so fastened on the goal, so fixed on the end zone. And you bring him down and he gets up and comes at you again and you bring him down and he comes at you again and you bring him down, but you know you're only fighting a delaying action. Sooner or later, that sucker's going into the end zone and he's going to punish you all the way to the goal line. That's David. Why is he a man after God's own heart? Because I believe he is pursuing after God. He is not perfect. This, this guy does some shocking stuff and some stupid stuff. Stupid stuff. Here's one. This, you, how many of you have ever made, let's just see what the level of honesty in the room is. I'm not talking about sinful. How many of you have ever looked back on something and said, wow, that, uh, I did that and that was really stupid. Raise your hand. Thank God. The rest of you, there's a lake of fire. All right. <laughs> When Saul, David's father-in-law, becomes so envious and filled with demons and hates, hates David, tries to kill him with a spear, throws a spear at his head, David ducks and it embeds in the wall. Every now and again, I, I teach leadership, and every now and again, somebody asks me, how do I know when it's time to leave where I work? Okay, this is just a thought. When that spear embeds... <laughs> That, that's the moment, okay? <laughs> what David didn't do was pull it out and throw it back. He never laid a hand on Saul. Twice he had the opportunity and refused to kill him. But when he leaves Saul and flees, where does he go? Logically, Samuel, the man who had anointed him king. He goes up to Samuel's place and hides out there. And Saul finds out about it and sends a group of cops up there to bust him. And when they come into the place where David and Samuel are, the spirit of God comes on them and the cops start prophesying over David. We don't, we don't know the exact words they said, but presumably it was all positive. We see the same saying, blessed art thou, God has removed Saul and put you on the throne. His anointing is upon you. And they go back to Saul with their tail between their legs. Saul says, did you get him? And they said, well, okay, now your majesty, it's a little complicated. So Saul sends another group. The same thing happens. Saul sends a third group. The same thing happens. Finally, Saul says to himself, look, there's an action proverb. If you want to kill somebody, kill him yourself. And so Saul goes up there to kill David. And when Saul bursts in on David and Samuel, the Spirit of God hits Saul. This is a bizarre scene. Saul strips off all his clothes, lays in the floor naked at David's feet, and Saul begins to prophesy. <laughs> Lying in the floor naked at David's feet. Blessed art thou, David, son of Jesse. God has removed me from the throne and placed his hand upon you. <laughs> and Saul leaves the next day. Lays all night on the floor, naked. He leaves the next day. Now think about this. God has protected David four times supernaturally. All he has to do is stand still. Instead, he leaves, flees. Where would he go? Now let's think about this. Where would he go that he might find safety? He goes I'm like Rick and Ricardo. Explain this to me. <laughs> he goes to Gath. Who can tell me who is the favorite son of Gath? The most famous man ever born at Gath. Goliath. Goliath. Whom David has killed and cut his head off in front of the entire army of Philistia. And David goes to Gath. Turn to your neighbor and say, Stupid. Did he think that they were going to elect him mayor? A ticker tape parade? Immediately they arrest him and throw him into prison. And they're going to kill him. Until David remembers an ancient Philistine superstition that it's bad luck to kill a madman. And David feigns madness. 
crawling on the floor and scratching at the door, foaming at the mouth and eating dirt and all that kind of stuff. And the king, Achish, says, get this guy out of here. And they drive David out of town, throwing rocks at him like a dog, like a mad dog. How humiliating. And he's alone in the desert at the cave of Adullam. Rejected, despised, can't see his family, can't go to Bethlehem, all alone in the wilderness. And, and his, only, his only hope is God. He's broken, busted down. And that's where, he, that's where he's so after God. Look, here's the thing. No matter what you've ever gone through, betrayal, the deepest human wound is betrayal. I don't know all of you. I, I know very few of you, actually. But there may be some woman here whose husband deserted her and went off with somebody else. That's a deep wound. David can sit across the coffee table from you and say, I know exactly how you feel. When David's own son leads a rebellion against him, drives him out of the capital city. David writes in the Psalms, if it had just been an enemy, it would have been all right. But it was, it was my friend who went with me to the house of God. David understood betrayal. I was a pastor of a megachurch in Orlando some years ago, and we had a minor rebellion, a departure. You know, you get these things in some churches, not here, but in other churches in galaxies far, far away. We had one. I, you know, I had 4,000 people in my church, two or 300 leave. It's not even statistically significant. It was emotionally significant. I, I, a group of men, all the years I was there, they came to my study before the Sunday morning service and we laid on our bellies on the floor in a semicircle with our Bibles in front of us, like our feet out, like the spokes of a wheel and prayed Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. One of the men that led that rebellion laid at my right hand. David understood what that was like. He said, it's not my enemy, O Lord. It's him that eateth at my right hand. David understood betrayal. David understood family confusion. David understood pain. David understood grief. David understood failure. David understood sin. David could sit across the coffee table with any person in this building, and no matter what you told him about your complex life, you also have lived a complex life. David could look you right straight in the eye and say, I know exactly what you're dealing with. That's what intrigues us about David. Still... We come to this, the man after God's own heart. In closing, let me give you something that isn't even in the book. When you research and get ready for a book, you accumulate all, when one does, you accumulate all this material. The issue is not what you use, it's what you don't use. You just have to cart, start carving things off. I won't use that, and I won't use that, and I won't use that. So I didn't want to get the book too theological. I didn't want all that. I wanted... I wanted it to be a book about the life and leadership and challenges of King David. But this is important. It's not in the book, but I'm, I'm giving it to you this morning. In Psalm 22, not the most famous Psalm of David. 23 is his most famous and probably second is 51. But 22 is a Psalm of David. In Psalm 22, David describes in graphic detail what it's like to be crucified. He describes crucifixion. He says, even my bones show. The picture is of a, 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 a rail thin naked body hanging on the cross. He even says, they have pierced my hands and my feet. He even says, they have, they cast lots for my garments. Do you remember the soldiers at the foot of the cross throwing dice for Jesus? It's, it's as if he's saying all this. Now, here's the thing. Listen to this. David is describing a form of execution that wasn't invented by the Romans for several hundred years. David has never seen a crucifixion, let alone see somebody nailed to a cross, let alone have somebody shooting dice for the garments. Shall David then be numbered among the prophets? So I, I know what we might say. Okay, we're looking back through the cross and we're imposing the cross on Psalm 22. 
but it's not really about the cross. I can understand that, except for one thing. On the cross, just a few moments before he died, Jesus cried out in Hebrew, Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani. Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And that's verse 1 of Psalm 22. When you're hanging in unspeakable agony on a cross, you're not thinking to yourself at a cognitive level, now what could I say here that would be meaningful for history? That has to come up out of inside of you. David affirms the prophetic nature of Psalm... Uh, Jesus affirms the prophetic nature of Psalm 22 in moments before he dies. Two kings born in the same little Jewish village a thousand years apart, together joined at the point of the crucifixion of Christ. David, this complex, complicated, deeply flawed, magnificent man. Now, if you buy this book or read it and you hear this message... And you say to yourself, David really was a great man. And that's all you say. Then I failed. But if you say the key to David's greatness was that his heart at the deepest level, despite his failings and his faults and even his abilities, his heart was fixed on God. The secret is not the greatness of David. The secret is the greatness of the God of David.